Thank you for joining us today on Edfal. Welcome to the program. I'm Ayola Kasim. Last year was the world's fifth hottest on record, while levels of planet warming carbon dioxide and methane in the atmosphere hit new highs in 2021. The EU's Copernicus Climate Change Service said in its latest report that the last seven years were the world's warmest by a clear merging. And the global temperature last year was 1.1 to 1.2 degrees Celsius, above 1850 to 1900 levels. And this is because global levels of carbon dioxide and methane, the main greenhouse gases, continue to climb and both hit record highs in 2021. We look at how we can curb the rise and how many are adapting to the impact of climate change today on the program. Please stay with us. Countries committed under the 2015 Paris Agreement to try to limit global temperature rise to 1.5 degrees Celsius. The level scientists say would avoid its worst impacts. That will require emissions to roughly halve by 2030, but so far they have charged higher. As greenhouse gas emissions change the planet's climate, the long-term warming trend has continued. So if we look at temperatures for the globe, as already stated, the seven last years were the warmest on, on record. And among those, 2021 ranks as one of the cooler. Um, in our data set, it's fifth, but it's only marginally warmer than 2015 and 2018. If you look at all the, the last seven years, they're not super close, but they're quite close together and they stand kind of well off the, the ones that uh, came before that. So it expected to have uh, some level of variability from year to year. Um, and there are different reasons for this. There are different uh, oscillations in the system. Climate change exacerbated many of the extreme weather events sweeping the world in 2021 from floods in Europe, China and South Sudan to wildfires in Siberia and the United States. After a temporary dip in 2020 at the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic, provisional data suggests global carbon dioxide emissions rebounded by 4.9% in 2021. Last summer was Europe's hottest on record. Following a warm March, an unusually cold April that had decimated fruit crops in countries including France and Hungary. In July and August, a Mediterranean heat wave stoked intense wildfires in countries including Turkey and Greece. Sicily set a new European temperature high of 48.8 degrees Celsius, a record awaiting official confirmation. In July, more than 200 people died when torrential rain triggered deadly flooding in Western Europe. Scientists concluded that climate change had made the floods at least 20% more likely. Also that month, floods in China's Henan province killed more than 300 people. In California, a record-smashing heat wave was followed by the second highest wildfire in the state's history. In a warming climate, we are expecting to see more and more frequent well, heat waves or, or more intense heat waves. And also there is already observ observational evidence that in Europe, due to the warming that's taken place already, heat waves have already become, uh, become more intense. Um, so you, you know, the heat wave last summer fits into that picture, but as Copernicus, we have not done uh, attribution studies of this yet. The Copernicus Climate Change Service says levels of methane, a particularly potent greenhouse gas, have jumped in the last two years, but the reasons why are not fully understood. Of course, uh, methane together with CO2 is a very potent uh, greenhouse gas, so it's a concern to see uh, the uh, atmospheric rate uh, double uh, compared to the, uh, to the average. Uh, maybe it's just part of variability, uh, but certainly uh, uh, science is needed to, uh, to see whether it's something part of the variability, possibly natural variability, uh, or if it's something that is linked to, uh, to the uh, more recent trends and uh, anthropogenic effect uh, to, to climate change. So I think it's worrying, 
principally uh, because it's high and we don't know exactly uh, well uh, what is the reason behind it. Emissions of methane range from oil and gas production and farming to natural sources like wetlands. Oslo-based N2 Applied is testing its plasma technology at several sites in Europe, including on three farms in the United Kingdom. At this site in Buckinghamshire, 200 dairy cows are providing the raw material, which is dung. A manure scrapper collects all the excrement from the barn floor and deposits it in a pit where it is then moved through the N2 machine, housed in a standard-sized shipping container. So with this machine, we are creating plasma, which is basically like lightning. And we create that in this section of the machine and force it through into the slurry, which is in this uh, second stage of the, of the process, uh, which is the absorption process. And that's where we're locking in both methane and ammonia emissions. Nitrogen from the air and a blast from a 50 kilowatt plasma torch is forced through the slurry, locking in both methane and ammonia emissions. In essence, we're harnessing lightning to zap livestock slurry and lock in harmful emissions like methane and ammonia. Uh, and as we know, um, methane, the potent greenhouse gas, uh, livestock are, are absolutely an emitter of that and, and we're here to solve that challenge. What comes out of the machine is an odorless brown liquid. And the, this is what comes out. We call it Neo, and the odor has been completely removed. According to N2, their Neo has doubled the nitrogen content of regular nitrogen fertilizer, one of the most commonly used fertilizers to boost production of corn, canola, and other crops. An over 99% reduction in methane emissions from, from slurry, so a practical elimination there. 95% uh, reduction in ammonia emissions, and we practically double the nitrogen content of the slurry, uh, which can be used as a more sustainable fertilizer source. On a 200 cow dairy farm, this equates to a reduction of 199 tons of carbon equivalent every year with one machine. Right now, the capacity is that one machine will treat the slurry from about 200 cows. Uh, but for farms that are bigger, you can stack them side by side or on, or on top of each other. N2 is now looking to scale out the technology across the United Kingdom livestock sector. And have recently installed it at a pig farm. It delivers uh, a reduction of 199 tonnes of carbon equivalent um, every year with, with one machine based on a 200 cow dairy farm. And so we're now looking to scale out this technology across the UK livestock sector. A commercial model of the device is due for release in June 2022 in a modular stackable form. So bigger farms can add units to cope with their amount of slurry. Exact pricing is yet to be announced, but the company says capital investment for a farm will be similar to that of a medium-sized tractor. The Global Methane Pledge, launched at the COP26 summit in Glasgow in November, committed to reducing methane by 30% by 2030. Methane has a higher heat trapping potential than carbon dioxide, but it breaks down in the atmosphere faster, meaning deep cuts in methane emissions by 2030 could have a rapid impact on slowing global warming. A United Nations report in May said steep cuts in methane emissions this decade could avoid nearly 0.3 degrees Celsius of global warming by the 2040s. Experts have said many of the challenges facing humankind, such as climate change, water scarcity, inequality and hunger, can only be resolved at the global level and by promoting sustainable development, a commitment to social progress, environmental balance and economic growth. As a part of a new sustainable development roadmap, the United Nations approved the 2030 Agenda, which contains the Sustainable Development Goals, a call to action to protect the planet and guarantee the global well-being of people. These common goals require the active involvement of businesses, administrations and countries, as well as individuals around the world.
My name is Donnell Baird. I am the CEO and founder of Block Power. And that is what Donnell is showcasing in the south of Bronx. He's playing with color, hoping to turn black and brown communities into multiple forms of green. After seeing our girls' inconvenient truth in college and becoming a climate activist, Donnell began his mission to tackle climate change and wealth disparities through his company, Block Power. Founded in 2014, Donnell created a technology platform that could help small apartment buildings and other urban structures become energy efficient. When you think of COVID-19, right, instead of blowing infected COVID-19 air from apartment to apartment, these units will suck in air, clean the, the air that's infected with a virus, and then recirculate into the next room. So not only are we making this building fossil fuel free, but we are also making it COVID-19 free. The company hopes to go public in seven years, with their ultimate goal being to reduce greenhouse gases by 30%. Donna explains block power as it turns buildings into Teslas. So we're taking software and what we're learning from Silicon Valley, we're taking finance and what we're learning from Wall Street, and then we're taking what we learn from politics and community organizing about how do you build relationships with local churches or synagogues or community institutions and build relationships with local building owners that they have trust with um, and how do you introduce that whole ecosystem to clean energy. And if customers don't have their own capital, the company lends them capital to pay for the construction workers and the equipment and then they pay block power back over 15 to 20 years. This building had oil, fossil fuel based heating, cooling, hot water systems. We're taking that out and we're putting in a smart, modern, all electric heating system and cooling system that you can operate from your smartphone. Um, that's going to reduce this building's greenhouse gas emissions by 70% and it's going to save this building owner you know, tens of thousands of dollars a year on lowering their energy bill. So that's what we do. We, we build software to analyze and finance and project manage these projects. And if folks don't have their own capital, then we lend them capital to pay for the construction workers and the equipment. And then they pay us back over 10 to 15 years. Wow. So this is how we hope to introduce clean energy equipment to black and brown communities across the country. Currently, Father Rudolf Gonzalez, the pastor the of St. Margaret Church in the South the Bronx, has, is financing their units through the company. They are controlled by this remote. And the church would normally spend thousands of dollars a year on oil and was about to spend $90,000 to repair their boiler before deciding to transition to clean energy. It has brought down our electrical costs and uh, we don't have a boiler to, to deal with or oil to have delivered and what have you. So uh, we're very, very happy with it. Nowadays, when we're thinking about uh, clean air and energy, this is a wonderful option. Uh, oil is expensive, boilers are expensive, they need maintenance. These are practically maintenance free. It's clean, it's quiet, and very efficient. Air kind of gets sucked in, it flows. Recently, here, the native New Yorker here, become hotter, the recipient hotter, of one of the largest so early stage funding rounds ever raised out. by a black entrepreneur. Block Power raised $63 million in debt and equity with the help of Goldman Sachs Group Incorporated and other investors. The bulk of the money will go toward financing energy-efficient heating and cooling systems for Block Power's clients. However, Donnell said being a person of color in the tech and climate world can sometimes be terrible. The reason that this is important is because in New York City and 100 other 50 cities around the country, there are new laws that say that you have to green your building, whether it's in 7 years, 10 years, 20 years. We're going to have to green 100 million buildings across America. Who gets those jobs? Who gets the wealth that gets created from that transition? And are we, as people of color, are we going to be at the forefront of that? Or are we going to be like left behind? Um, and so I think, I think we should lead it. So that's what Block Power is about. Another hurdle has been convincing minorities of the benefit of investing with his company after suffering during the 2009 mortgage crisis. Black and brown people care a lot about clean energy. We are also worried about financial gimmicks. 
the greatest loss of black wealth in American history occurred in 2009 in the real estate collapse, when all of the homes that black and brown people had worked so hard to buy were lost in the subprime mortgage crisis. And so now when you approach black and brown communities talking about, hey, I have this new financial tool, people are like, oh, this kind of looks and feels like the subprime mortgage crisis. So the challenge isn't do black and brown people want clean energy? We do. Um, we learned that from Obama. We understand that our communities have the most pollution. We have the most lead. Our buildings have asbestos. None of that is good for our health and our kids' health. We want clean energy. We want the jobs that come from clean energy. The question is, can we build a trust with black and brown communities to say, we're going to come into your building and do something that's good for you, and you can have a 15-year financial relationship with us, and we're not going to screw you over. So that's the hard part. It's about. In 2019, so former President Bill Clinton so toured the system block power installed at Cornerstone Baptist Church in Brooklyn, New York, and praised Donnell for the work the his company is doing. Donnell counts this moment as one of the highlights for the company, which received early support from the Clinton Foundation. Secular, drought-resistant Tolu Kerr Gardens have sprung up in Senegal. It is a sustainability project hoping to make a more local approach to what is known as Africa's Great Green Wall Initiative, which aims to slow desertification across the continent Sahel region. These Senegalese farmers are planting the gardens known as the Luc Kerr. The Great Green Wall project is an ambitious attempt to plant 5,000 mile belt of trees including edible species like papayas and mangoes, as well as medicinal plants like moringa and sage across the length of the Sahel from Senegal to Djibouti. Bokidewe is a border town in northeastern Senegal. So you see here, it's almost 100 papaya trees. Here you have the medicinal plants in the front row, and the next three rows are dedicated to the vegetables, a variety of vegetables, the papaya, the lemon trees, citrus trees, cashew trees, the native trees, fertility trees, at the back the baobab and the African mahogany, which are bigger. So in the end, we have an island just here. The garden's purpose is multifold, restoration, slowing desertification, and improving food security and livelihoods of the people living in the Sahel. We need to think of the Great Green Wall as big, but with actions that are permanent, useful and consequential, and not just say we shall have make the Great Wall greener, but you see, and it's possible, imagine 1,000 Tuluka, 2,000 Tuluka interconnected. 1,000 Tuluka equals 1.5 million trees. Do you realize? So if we start, we can make a lot. When the COVID-19 crisis began, Senegal's borders were closed to many foreign imports and travelers, including Ali, who was visiting from Brazil, where he's based. I've done a lot in Brazil, but I feel better being at home, and I think that this is probably making the diaspora think as well. The building of our dear Africa, it has to be done by people who are here, but also by the diaspora, because we have a lot of knowledge outside the country. We have to come back and build. And COVID showed us. I wasn't scared. I thought, leave your company that you've had for 20 years, etc., etc. But what I'm doing here excites me. I feel more useful because over there, people can probably continue my work better than me. Here, we need it. We need us to say it. I'm ready for this. I don't care about the rest. Ali says the key to the success of the Tolu Kerr Gardens has been a strong sense of local ownership for residents such as Musa Kamara, who works at a local bakery at night. This project offers an opportunity to feed their families better. The day people will realize the full potential of the Great Green Wall, they will stop these dangerous migration routes where you can lose your life at sea. I think it's much better to work the soil for two years, two years only. With what they will harvest here, they will never want to leave because they will have their fathers, their mothers, their wives and their children with them. It's better to stay, work the soil, cultivate and see what you can earn.
It was from the ensuing shortages in food imports during COVID-19 crisis, particularly acute in Senegal's remote desert regions, that Ali and the project's manager, Karim Fakuri, who leads Eco-Village Development for Senegal's Reforestation Agency, drew inspiration for the Tolu Kerr. This secular notion is strong. It's about permaculture because there is biodiversity, meaning that there are a number of species that are mixed. It allows you to reinforce the production without using chemicals. Therefore, it is the strength coming from the mix of species that allows the setup of permaculture. Donc, c'est la force du mélange des espèces qui permet d'installer la permaculture. It's not clear how successful the new project will be. At one Toluco, in the remote village of Walalde, the desert had already begun to reclaim the land. But most Toluco have flourished. In the seven months since the project began, around two dozens of them have sprouted throughout Senegal. Meanwhile, a project in Western Kenya is using biogas technology to tackle two major pollution problems with one device, a machine that converts waste, such as the invasive water hyacinth, into clean cooking fuel. On the glistening waters of Lake Victoria, Dominic Kahumbu and his team use rakes and their hands to yank out bunches of water hyacinths. The weed-like plant harms aquatic life, including fish in the lake, and helps bacteria and mosquitoes flourish. Posing health risks to local communities, Dominic, a Kenyan entrepreneur, is piloting a machine that converts waste, such as invasive water hyacinth, into cleaner cooking fuel. What we're doing out here on Lake Victoria is we're harvesting this, what everyone considers to be a real menace and a pest, an invasive species, and it has many, many negative connotations to it. But the actual fact is water hyacinth is a blessing in disguise. The elderly people who should be retiring are choking themselves to death, which is, you know, it's, it's criminal at this, in, this, in this day and age that we should allow such a thing. When we have very, very, this, this, this is biogas. They should all have biogas. The machines run on waste, such as ground up water hyacinths, which has carpeted large parts of Lake Victoria, the freshwater lake between Kenya, Uganda, and Tanzania. The gas is tapped uh, from the center of the, of the actual digester tube. Uh, it comes down, you have a control valve. Uh, the water is the trap to stop um, any condensed water is directed back into the bottle and then the gas flows freely straight to the point of use. The project has so far provided 50 digesters to homes um, in the city of Kisumu in western Kenya, enabling families to switch from wood or charcoal, both of which are hazardous according to the World Health Organization and time-consuming cooking methods. Some of the families were given a gas stove as part of the project to replace their jiko, a portable stove that uses charcoal. Many of the digesters were also given out for free, with the rest subsidized by the company. The gas has no smoke, it has no smell, then it is much faster than the jiko. The digesters designed by Biogas International used two to three kilograms of water hyacinths scraped from the lake to power a cooker that can make a meal of maize and beans in around four hours. But at a cost of $650, the digesters are not affordable for most families in the city. Dominic acknowledged the World Bank put gross domestic product per capita in Kenya at just over $1,800 in 2020. Although the technology is scalable, the high cost of producing each digester makes turning a profit unlikely for at least another five years. The gas Dominic said uh, the firm the needed the, the, new the capital investment to produce more digesters. Uh, comes down, you have a control. Thousands of organizations out there that are looking for where can I 
buy carbon credits, where can I you know, sponsor green movements and what have you. Um, these are the kind of projects we're, we're trying to look for. All we need is the capital investment to invest in the equipment and then the sale of the fertilizer and the sale of the gas pays for the running. Two large versions of the equipment, which are still in the testing phase, will produce clean cooking fuel on an industrial scale for restaurants, poultry farms and fish drying facilities in the area. When it comes to living more sustainably, we've been told it's not big companies or governments leading the charge, it's individuals and families making their own rules and making change at the grassroots level. We hope you'll do your part. That's our show for the week. Be sure to join us next week from all of us here in Lagos. It's bye for now.